All right, fellas, we got a lot of news to cover, a lot of new hardware stuff coming out. As always, I'm going to divide it into new hardware slash handhelds, fire advice, bugs, fixes, slash updates. I think I said fixes. <laughs> and then we're going to have user creations and then channel spotlights. As always, I'm going to timestamp everything so you can skip around to the parts that seem interesting to you. And so why don't we get into it? So here we have something I thought was cool. This is from the channel Macho Natural Productions on YouTube. I'm a big fan of this channel. The hardware mods he showcases are pretty cool. So if you're really into modding existing hardware, your older consoles, then this is a fantastic channel. So this is a memory card for the PS2, and it seems to be pretty fancy. Uh, it has an OLED screen on it, and you can boot to a ISO loader and then create virtual memory cards that will load per game. It seems very fancy. It's built in Wi-Fi. You can navigate to it to control all the features. Anyways, if you want to check it out, I highly recommend checking out the video if you have a PS2 and want to get something like this. Okay, for our next item, this is very interesting and take it with a giant grain of salt. This is from the YouTube channel Moore's Law is Dead. And they're saying that there's rumors or speculation that Sony may be possibly working on a Vita 2. Now, their source is Trust Me Bro, so, you know, <laughs> they can be making this up. But one thing I would say is, you know, check it out yourself. You know, just know that anything can be fake these days. If you don't cite a source that we can't verify, uh, then it's hard to know if it's real or not. But I understand why if the source is leaking data that's supposed to be under NDA, obviously they're not going to reveal themselves. I thought this was interesting and it got me a little bit excited because the handheld, theoretically speaking, you know, they're speculating that it's supposed to be able to run PS4 games natively, digital games, and that they're going to release it around the same time as the PlayStation 6 as part of their ecosystem so that whatever games they release going forward can also be played on this handheld. So the guy who goes into why he thinks Sony would do this is because they saw Steam making bank on the Steam Deck where people want a piece of hardware and they don't want a PC, they want something portable and then they can have the option to play on the PC and then play seamlessly on the handheld and vice versa. And so he was guessing that maybe Sony wanted to go that route where instead of creating a handheld that can only play games for that handheld, why not create a handheld that can play games on the console as well? So it's all speculation, but you know, it says here, not technically greenlit for launch yet. We'll see if it ever comes out. Again, take it with a huge grain of salt, but you know what? That would be amazing. Uh, people love, you know, the Vita and the PSP when it came out. And I would love to see another dedicated handheld from Sony because when they make it, it does feel pretty premium. Now, <laughs> this is just wishful thinking, but I wish Nintendo would re-release the Nintendo 3DS because those are getting expensive. <laughs> I would love it if they like re-release all the Game Boys, like a Game Boy Advance with like a better screen, SP, Micro. Micro was my favorite. Retro Game Core released a review on the Pow Kitty RGB 10 Max 3. The naming convention is very confusing because there already is a Pow Kitty RGB 10 Max 3 Pro. This is the non-pro version and it's essentially the same as the X55. Now you might be asking, why release the same hardware if it already exists in the previous console? I, I, know, I don't know. <laughs> I saw the review and in summary, essentially it just has better ergonomics and button placement. So if that interests you, you might check it out. Russ did also say that it seems to be better built than other Pal Kitty consoles. Now there is one con, and that is when Russ was doing his teardown, the triggers are held onto the console by plastic tabs, and it might be a little bit hard to get them off without breaking it. And the reason why you want to get them off is there are two screws located underneath the triggers that you need to remove before you can take it apart. So keep that in mind. As always, if you want to check out more information about the device, you can go check out the channel. Retro Game Core is pretty darn excellent. Okay, here's a console I never heard of, and this is from ETA Prime, and it is the One X Player X1. Now, this is a huge screen. It is 10.5 inches. 
Let me just double. Yeah, 10.95. Oh my god. <laughs> that is a huge screen. It's very powerful, has a high resolution, and it's on par with like the high-end AMD CPUs. So the, the performance is pretty good, but also comes with a hefty price tag. But yeah, it just looks wonky. And, you know, for me, I thought that it wouldn't be really comfortable holding a device like that. So I asked my buddy who has a PlayStation Portal, and he said he loves that thing. So you know what? Even though it might look a little weird, I bet it would feel okay. But that screen, it looks gorgeous, by the way. If you want more information, you can go check out the channel. I don't know who it's going to appeal to. You're going to have to have a lot of money. <laughs> Here we have this post from Ib Duang. Uh, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. If I didn't, I apologize. And this is more footage from the RG556. Now, it looks pretty good. But I always, I take anything from the manufacturer with a grain of salt because you know they can fake it and they can kind of embellish the actual performance to make themselves look better. And companies have done that before, so I give them zero trust. <laughs> the only trust I have is when I have the product before me and I can see it for myself. But yeah, for those of you interested, this kind of kind of wet the whistle, so to speak. The main thing I'm interested in is in the price, you know? Like, it looks like a nice device. I wonder how much it'll cost. All right, moving on, we have pricing for the MSI Claw, and I got this from ETA Prime. I check out all the sources I possibly can to get as much information as possible. And here we have the range being from $700 to $800. And it kind of makes sense because this is the same price range for the Lenovo Legion Go. And pretty much any Windows handheld console that's coming out lately has been kind of in that price range. So this seems pretty okay for what you're getting. Uh, we'll see the actual performance and feel of it. But yeah, for those of you who are interested in another handheld that ran Windows, uh, this, this might be up your alley if you have the money. All right, speaking of prices, we also have pricing updates on the Ioneo Flip keyboard and DS. This was posted by Rush Time 33 and as no surprise, it's going to be pretty pricey to get these. So here we have the US pricing and we're going to see the official retail starting at $940 <laughs> going up to about $1500. Uh yeah, that that's expensive, but you know what? I really want one of those. You know, I really like the DS, and it would be super cool if I could play DS games upscaled, but not at that price. At that point, I'd rather just get a 3DS, a new 3DS, and call it a day. But yeah, for that price, you could fly to Japan and get yourself one and come back, maybe. <laughs> okay, here's the price for the keyboard, and we see something similar. $900-ish for the official retail price and about 1400-ish, 1500-ish for the higher end models. Okay, our next piece of hardware is a phone, and this is from Taki Udon's YouTube channel, and it's the ROG Phone 8 Pro running the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 processor. And yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome in terms of performance, also has a pretty high price tag. <laughs> Phones these days are crazy good, but if you want to check it out, I would recommend watching Taki's video. As always, he does a pretty thorough job of breaking down the hardware. Speaking of breaking down the hardware, we have a teardown and emulation test. It's very thorough and it's from the Retro Tech Dad and he's breaking down the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting to see the hardware there and the emulation test. He was pretty into it. So if you want to get a good idea of the performance of the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, you can check this video out. As always, I link everything in the description and in the comments so you can see everything for yourself. And this is something more of a PSA. So this this post is from user Holiday Salamander21, and he got a notification that his Game Force Ace is finally shipping. If you order one of these and you're wondering when it's coming, check your email to make sure you didn't get a shipping notification. <laughs> he did say, "Oh, it's being sent to the wrong address." That's a rest in pepperoni. <laughs> Hopefully you get a ship to the right address, Elemander. I was losing my voice there. Anyways, moving on to buyer advice, we have this post from N Roxers. What is the best option for Xbox Remote Play? And there's a person here, available buzz 69 that says your phone and a Kishi or game cert would probably do it great. The reason why I bring this up every time is if your main goal is to play games, 
and you don't have a device and you're deciding on what to buy, I think the best thing to do is if you have a phone that can emulate any sort of system at all, I would try checking it out on your phone first to get a feel for what kind of things are deal breakers for you. So if you're playing on your phone and you're like, man, I wish the screen was bigger, then you narrow down your choices a lot more effectively. And if you're like, man, playing horizontal kind of sucks, I want to play vertical or vice versa, then you can narrow that down even further. So using your phone is a great way to kind of gauge what are your parameters for a device that would fit you. The other thing is obviously your budget. So, you know, but yeah, if you're just wanting to get the hardware and you have the money, don't even think about it. Just buy it. <laughs> Everything else is an excuse. You know, you want it, just get it. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Don't waste your money, but yeah. <laughs> All right. We have a SD card related post from Sada Narakman. The reason why I bring these posts up is, you know, people always say, watch out for using the stock SD card and watch out for counterfeits. If it's too good to be true, it usually is. And so this guy bought a clear counterfeit, the Evo Plus packaging, but Samsung Pro. <laughs> Look at this pro select like what you know what what is this scam job anyways you you can't buy it from eBay or Amazon unless you're buying directly from a seller that only has one source for those cards Amazon will commingle the inventory so even if you're buying from Amazon the inventory can come from some other company that snuck in you know counterfeit cards if you don't have an option, because this guy said he didn't really have a choice to buy it anywhere else, I will look for a brick and mortar store. Now, if you're living in a place where you don't have that, then yeah, you're going to have to, you know, test the cards out to make sure they're not counterfeit before you use them. And here's why you never use a stock SD card. This post is from user Epic TVs. I hope that's how you pronounce the name. Anyways, this guy is pretty upset because he borked the Saturn fo folder on his Ambernic Arc B. If you kind of read through it, it's because the SD card is pretty much corrupted. So this is why I always say, <laughs> follow the advice and get a reputable SD card. And if you're buying it online, if you're buying it anywhere, watch out for counterfeits. And the reason why is, you know, I know why people don't get it. It's because, oh, they don't want to spend the money. But the thing is, like, you're going to get it corrupted sooner or later. And it's better it corrupts sooner because imagine if you're playing on a device and you had it for a year and you're fine and you're like, it's never going to happen to me. Those people warning me about the stock SD card were just making stuff up. And then it strikes and then all your save files are gone. A year's worth of progress gone. You're going to regret it then. So... <laughs> I uh, just, just look at how much SD cards cost. I don't, you know, I don't know what region you'll live in, but the lower end SD cards should be affordable. So figure out the price of the console and then count or include the cost of a new SD card in that price to figure out your budget. It's pretty much the only thing that you need to buy when you're buying these handhelds. And that is a new SD card. And if you already have one already, you can use that. But if you don't have any. Now this post might bring up some controversy, but this is from user dragon two nine nineteen sixty five. Now this guy is bringing up some possible button issues with the Retro Pocket Four. Apparently, the shoulder button is getting damaged fairly quickly for some users, and this was a problem that existed on the Retro Pocket Three. And I believe the fix is to get a new spring. Now they claim that the newer Retro Pocket 4s that ship out won't have the issue. But I don't know, man. If you had an issue on the previous model and you don't fix it for your second iteration, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, just keep that in mind. If you're planning on buying a Retro Pocket 4 or 4 Pro, you already, or you already bought one and the shoulder button doesn't work, you got to give them an email and they'll send you the replacement springs. Is it annoying? Yes. I feel like this isn't something the consumer should have to deal with. I think that's up to the company to fix it. I know like if there's like hardware problems that uh, they didn't anticipate or they didn't know about, 
and it just comes down to a crappy QA process, I think that might be sort of understandable considering how cheap some of the devices cost. For, for something that costs a little bit more, I expect it to be a bit more solidly built. Uh, but yeah, it comes with the territory. It's an unfortunate byproduct of dealing with a market where there's basically no QA process. Okay, now we're moving on to updates, fixes, and bugs. And this is related to the previous post. We have user Biting Chaos on the Retroid subreddit. And this one is about accessibility controls. So apparently there are some software problems and there's a lot of them and it breaks it down in depth, in detail with possible fixes. So if you are having any issues with software, especially related to accessibility, I would check this post out because there, there are some fixes here. Now you do have to use um, <laughs> the ADB shell and stuff. I just want to give a little warning here. So I have a Samsung phone and there's bloatware on that phone and I hate the Samsung bloatware. So I went through, I removed it manually using, you know, ADB and yeah, I deleted some programs that my phone needed and I, I kind of almost bricked it. So <laughs> if you're going in there yellow solo, just doing things willy nilly, uh, I'd say be a little bit careful, you know? I have a tendency to kind of just dive in and mess around. And then, you know, I almost ruined my phone. But thankfully, I didn't. And this is about upgrading the RGB 30. This is from user Rocket Mouth. So he made a video and his channel is Rocket underscore Mouth. It was upgrading the speakers. One thing I noticed was for these handhelds, there are speaker mods. Like for the Mi Mini Plus, I know there is a very popular speaker mod. And while it increases the volume, for me, it doesn't really increase the clarity too much. And so that's, that's something to consider if you wanted like way more clarity out of your speakers. Uh, for me, uh, you know, for me, for my ears, I couldn't really tell a huge noticeable difference. The biggest thing was the volume was way, way louder. So anyways, there's a lot of fixes you can do for the RGB 30. I can look through and talk to the person if you want. Yeah, for example, if you wanted to mod your RGB 30, you can kind of dampen the shoulder buttons. You can fix diagonal issues with the D-pad. And there's a lot of stuff you can do. So you can check it out if you want. That was from the Angriest Bird. And he links a video and Retro Game Core. Okay, this is for the Odin 2 as well as the Retro Pocket 4 and 4 Pro. This is from Joey's Retro Handhelds. And he goes over two tools I think are pretty cool. So Odin Tools and Optanium. Odin Tools lets you tweak your settings and Optanium lets you auto update your apps. So I think it's pretty handy. Looks like a nice quality of life addition. So if you have an Odin 2 or a Retroid Pocket 4, you might want to check these two apps out. You can check out Joey's channel if you want to get more information. All right, this next news item is related to the R43 Pro and it's from user Selfish. That's a nice name. And this guy took apart his R43 Pro and it was a RK3566 chip right there. So that's a pretty good chip. And for the price of the console, it's actually pretty darn decent. I think you can get these for roughly $65 on AliExpress. And for that level of hardware, well, that seems like a decent deal. Now it is in a vertical form factor. So, you know, if you want a horizontal form factor, that's plenty of those RK3566 consoles. But yeah, there you have it. Super powerful vertical form factor. All right, this is a update news item from user snake218. And it's just letting people know that the MiU custom firmware 2.0 is available for the Pocket Go, Pow KDV90, Q90, and Q20. People are reporting in the comments that for the latest build of the firmware for the V90, that the emulation performance is pretty close to stock and you get to use the benefits of RetroArch. So if you have a V90 and you're like, man, I wish I could have custom firmware and RetroArch, you can check out the latest build and it should be pretty okay. If you get the latest stable build, then the emulation performance will be pretty poor. But if you get the latest one, it should be okay according to the commenters. All right, now moving on to user creations. This post is from Shigarui, and this is a pretty nice user compiled and recommended list of one-handed games for fans of the RG Nano, 
GKD Pixel, the Miu Mini V4 or the older versions, etc. So if it's a super tiny console and you like playing with one hand, there's a list of games that people recommended. So you can check this list out. And there are no links to ROMs and links to ROMs aren't allowed in the subreddit. Uh, you can DM the OP and he'll send you a link to this curated list of ROMs that you can download. I think it looks pretty nice. It's Pico 8 as well. So there's, there's a lot of games on here. And the list seems pretty solid. These are games that I would want to play regardless if it was one-handed or not. Moving on to our next user creation. This is from Fox Trout 200 And it is a printable grip for the RGB30. He links the file. It's available for free. Now, if you check the comments, we have a little discussion on which 3D printer will be the best to get if you are on a budget. I like this recommendation from Tapas of Dogs. You can get the Ender 3 V3 SE for 200 and then the Neptune 4, and then the Bamboo Lab Printer. I don't have a 3D printer, but I might look into getting one if I can get enough money saved to start making mods for these handhelds. I think it's great that someone made this and then they released it for free, expecting nothing in return. Um, <laughs> I know this is going to happen, but some company in China is probably going to take the free files and then start printing it themselves and sell it for a massive markup. It's going to happen. <laughs> I thought this was a pretty cool die job from user itched. It's a Miu Mini V4 and a Miu Mini Plus die job. I think it turned out great. It looks fantastic. Great job, dude. It looks super nice. I like that shade of orange. Got a blue here. It looks really good. There's a little bit more detail from the OP if you want to check it out here, if you want to do it yourself. Next up, we have this abomination. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's pretty darn neat. Like, I, I don't know how you got this to work, but. This is the Miu Mini Horizontal Mod from user Irez Dolby, and it's essentially two Miu Minis kind of stuck together. I'm surprised it works. Uh, but there you have it. You can kind of control it on both sides. <laughs> I was looking into how, how to mod the hardware because one of my goals is to take the Miu Mini Plus and then create a better shell. There's a couple of things I want to do with it. I want to add high quality stereo speakers. I want to include Bluetooth and then a bigger battery. I want the case to be a little bit wider, just a tad wider and a little bit longer like the original Game Boy Color. And more importantly, I want it to be shock resistant. So when you drop it, even throw it against the wall, I don't want anything in there to break. So there's some ideas I had, but you know, I, I got to figure out how to, how to get to the point where I can take a Mew Mini Plus and then just easily transfer it over to the case. I had thoughts of like shipping over the motherboard and the screen and the controller parts and membranes uh, in bulk and then fitting them into a new shell and then selling it like that. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's like that meme where it's like, just because you could, does it mean you should, you know? <laughs> All right, this is pretty neat. This is the channel spotlight. This is posted by user 12 gauge savior. And so the YouTube video from channel level one online is for a FPGA and it runs the SNES. Now it's not perfect. Some games don't run perfectly and it is a little bit on the expensive side. So when you buy all the parts, it's going to be roughly 90 bucks. And you can buy everything from AliExpress, but this guy goes into detail about how to set it up. It seems pretty easy. Just snap it all together and then you download the software and then you can run it. But if you want more details, you can check the channel out. You know, I think it's pretty neat because FPGA hardware emulation is a relatively new scene. I know it existed a long time ago, but being used for emulation and being able to be bought at a semi-low price for just an average person to take it and run games on it, I think that's awesome. I would love to see hardware accurate emulation and have that in the hands of people because these consoles are getting a little bit hard to find and they're getting kind of expensive. So being able to, you know, for a Super Nintendo that can run Super Nintendo games would be pretty cool. Any, any system that you imagine uh, being preserved for, you know, future generations or just people who wanted it but never could afford it or they had it and they gave it away and now they can't find one. Okay, that's going to be it. This video ran a little bit long and I was losing my voice in the process. 
hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed what you saw. If there's anything I left out or anything you want me to cover, if there's anything I can do to improve this video, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. Uh, as always, thank you so much for dropping by and watching. I really do appreciate it. And hope you guys are staying safe and staying out there. And I'll catch you guys next time.